Thank you for joining us for this course, and please join me in welcoming Marietta Cambrieri. Thank you and welcome. Thanks, Jasmine, for that very nice introduction. And I should also say that the, the Della Robbia show will also be on view at the National Gallery after the Boston venue. So that's a very exciting uh, development. Uh, this morning, we're going to spend some time thinking about Leonardo and sculpture. And I uh, put together a handout for you that do keep it to hand, because there are going to be spellings of words and Italian phrases and things that will be helpful for you. Um, so. Uh, I'll also say just a quick word. You guys are experts by now because this is the fourth week, so you could probably be teaching this class to me. Um, but I, so I really put very, very few readings on this list because I try to really limit it to things that I particularly love. I can't help but put Kenneth Clark on it because he's still my favorite to read on Leonardo. Uh, Martin Kemp and the more recent um, exhibition catalog on Leonardo. Uh, uh, painter at the court of Milan. Uh, Kemp and Sison and, and, and are particularly sensitive to uh, Leonardo's relationships with sculpture. Uh, I also include in, uh, the catalog of a show called Leonardo da Vinci and the Art of Sculpture, which if you really wanted to find one thing to uh, look through for sculpture, that would be it. And I can't help but include a, a, something in Italian. I put it in brackets. You don't have to read it. But um, it was written by my advisor uh, called Leonardo e la Scultura. Uh, and um, really, it was from her that I learned about uh, sculpture and about Leonardo's relationship to sculpture. So this kind of comparison that you see up on the screen of our wonderful Donatello and uh, Leonardo's Madonna of, uh, and Child with St. Anne um, was something that I learned way back as an undergraduate and was an inspiration to me throughout. Uh, there are also some little quotes and things on the page, so uh, th that'll be fun for you to have. So um, this morning, I'm going to take us through a series of themes, uh, which include, um, for example, the impact of Donatello uh, and other Florentine 15th century sculptors on Leonardo. Leonardo's relationship with his teacher, Verrocchio, who was a painter sculptor like Leonardo himself. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Leonardo's sculptures, even though there really aren't any of them. Um, and that's a story in itself. And I will conclude by talking about um, Leonardo and Giovanni Francesco Rustici, uh, the sculptor who worked most closely with Leonardo and who in many ways embodies um, ideas, themes um, uh, that Leonardo uh, shared with him and uh, that they seem to have absorbed together in places like, uh, from artists like Verrocchio and uh, others. But what I would like to start with is a little conversation about the paragone, which uh, the Italian word paragone means um, comparison. But in the Renaissance, paragone means so much more. Uh, and it really, we will concentrate on this conversation, uh, which uh, pits the arts of painting against the arts of sculpture. And the Renaissance loved to do this. They loved to make comparisons. There are comparisons between poetry and painting, painting and sculpture, um, color and design, drawing and design. Uh, so um, it's almost, and this is not being um, flippant, it was almost like a party game because it allowed these conversations to happen often in courtly settings uh, where um, it's kind of like the debating society. You get your theme, and you try to, you try to make your point as best as you can. Um, I show one of the most splendid uh, drawings in the exhibition uh, in the Torf Gallery now, the, this wonderful um, uh, comparison. This is a paragone between old and young, uh, these two splendid profiles 
facing off against each other. Leonardo loved this kind of thing. This is a quintessential Leonardo drawing because throughout his, throughout his paintings, throughout his drawings, he loved to juxtapose in this way because the more you look at the young, beautiful youth with his amazing curly hair, the more you appreciate the balded skull of the, old, the, older, the older man and the wisdom that it, that it conveys. And they literally speak to each other. And that essentially is what the Paragone is about. Um, yeah, it's whether who's, which is better, but in articulating which is better, you're actually making the argument for both. So that's a, uh, it's a concept that uh, Leonardo very much uh, carries forth also in his drawings. And when I say it was a kind of courtly, uh, a kind of courtly game, uh, anyone who has read the wonderful uh, Book of the Courtier by Baldassare Castiglione, and I show him to you in Raphael's stunning portrait uh, in the Louvre, uh, but he, this uh, treatise on how to be a good courtier incorporates uh, a, a whole section on the comparison between painting and sculpture. Uh, and in fact, Leonardo's writings on that, and I gave you a few snippets uh, on, your, on your handout, Leonardo is one of the first in the Renaissance to put these things down on paper, and then Castiglione uh, includes it in his dialogue. So um, we remember that Leonardo was seeking the post of court artist when he uh, was hoping to go to Milan. From everything we know about Leonardo, he was the ideal courtier. He was handsome, he played music, he was graceful. Of course, he was a genius. He was a painter, he was a sculptor, he was a, an engineer, all these things. Uh, and so uh, this notion of um, how, how a good courtier behaves also encompasses this ability to play one thing off another. Um, so if we were doing, you know, if this were exam period like it is for uh, many of our fellow students uh, at this time, this would be a, a very straightforward compare and contrast, right? So the great Michelangelo in his David epitomizing sculpture, the great uh, Mona Lisa by Leonardo epitomizing um, painting. And so um, the things that one has, the other doesn't, right? So, but for Leonardo, painting was the winner. And he says that he could make this, uh, he could argue for this because he was both a painter and a sculptor. And it's uh, sort of funny to hear one of the first and important to Leonardo arguments uh, about why sculpture wasn't so good. And on your sheet, I have a little quote that says, um, sculpture is not a science, but a very mechanical art because it causes its executant sweat and bodily fatigue. So this is, so there's this wonderful uh, section in the comparison between painting and sculpture from the treatise on painting that uh, gathers together uh, Leonardo's thoughts, and he says, um, this is an extremely mechanical operation, and he is talking, this is very important, about marble sculpture, the marble sculptor. It's generally accompanied by great sweat, which mingles with dust and becomes converted into mud. His face becomes plastered and powdered all over with marble dust, which makes him look like a baker and he becomes, in, he becomes covered in minute chips of marble, which makes him look as if he's covered in snow. His house is a mess and covered in chips and dusts from the stone. Why should this matter? Well, because in the Renaissance at this moment, artists were really engaged in a, 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 a quest to have their um, profession uh, esteemed as part of the liberal arts. And so how, how an artist lived and how he worked, how, how he or she worked, mattered. And this is all part of the persona that the artist is trying to develop. And nobody uh, uh, more than Leonardo, the aspiring court artist. So the painter, on the other hand, the, the painter's position is quite contrary to this. Um, speaking, of course, of painters and sculptors of the highest ability. 
Uh, because the painter sits before his work at the greatest of ease, well-dressed and applying delicate colors with his light brush, and he may dress himself in whatever clothes he pleases. His residence is clean and adorned with delightful pictures, and he often enjoys the accompaniment of music or the company of authors of various fine works that can be heard with great pleasure without the crashing of hammers and other confused, confused noises. So you can see he's painting this picture of what it is like to, um, to be a painter and not a sculptor. But um, the comparison you see up on the screen, I don't have to take you through it, because, because you see already the what does the sculpture have. It has this great nobility. It's a colossus. It's beautiful Carrara marble, uh, permanence, the brilliance of Michelangelo, the evocation of the antique. Whereas the, the, the Mona Lisa has color and depth and landscape and this incredible breath of life. And I'll never forget someone who said once that you, would all, you can almost see that Mona Lisa is being painted with music playing. You can almost see that that has enlivened her, her, um, her visage. That smile, the famous smile, all of those things. So um, after I put this together, I realized that I probably should have not called this section learning to look, but perhaps learning to see. Uh, and for Leonardo, really sight is the, um, is the primary um, sense. Because he was also engaged in this, it's not just painting versus sculpture for him, it's also painting versus music, painting versus poetry. But for Leonardo, it really is the eye and what, the, what we see. And much of what he learned about uh, when he was learning to see, uh, we can trace through his looking at works like our beautiful Schiacciato Relief by Donatello. Uh, and I hope many of you are very familiar with this work, but I just want to um, remind you of this amazing technique developed by Donatello, uh, probably in the 14 teens, which is a very, very shallow relief. It's almost like drawing on stone. And with this very, very shallow carving, Donatello manages to create an incredible sense of depth and relief. And in those things that I have just said, there are very, very important things for Leonardo. Leonardo didn't necessarily consider a relief like this a sculpture. For Leon Battista Alberti, writing um, in uh, the 1430s about the art of painting, and for Leonardo, and for Donatello creating this object, this kind of flat relief, very low relief, is actually more like painting than it is like sculpture. It has its basis in drawing or disegno, and it is not that story of the art, you know, the big marble sculpture uh, chipping, being chipped away. One of the benefits that Leonardo sees in this type of relief is actually that it's not as messy. So, um, so it also, uh, this notion of creating depth or salience, in Italian, rilievo, or relief, is a very, very important concept because it is what, uh, what Leonardo does so brilliantly, uh, creating a sense of depth in space. Uh, and we can see that uh, in, the, in the very powerful three-dimensionality of this small relief. Getting to that point for Leonardo would have been an act of ingenio or talent but so much more than talent. It's the whole intellectual framework that an artist con consistently strives for. So learning to see that, see the world, and put onto the two dimensions, the whole quality of three-dimensionality and space becomes a vital, vital aspect of this dialogue between painting and sculpture and why painting ultimately uh, and drawing and low relief are the best because they involve more intellect. 
So I will start uh, by uh, showing you uh, the Donatello's famous St. George and the Dragon, which is in the Bargello Museum, made around, um, around uh, 1415. But we're going to concentrate on the, um, the low relief uh, in its uh, predella kind of space. It's the famous St. George and the Dragon, and it is the first time that this technique of relievo schiacciato a uh, flattened relief turns up. You can see it particularly, uh, so you see St. George killing the dragon, saving the princess, and it all takes place in a deep uh, perspective landscape culminating in this background, which I'm gonna show you in black and white because it, it turns up uh, more clearly. And you can see that the trees in the distance, it's as if the air is rustling the trees. It's as if you can see um, the atmosphere enveloping the trees. They get smaller and they get sketchier. And that's a visual discovery that really takes place more or less at this moment, and it takes place in this form of sculpture. And it's something of a truism in, uh, in early Italian art of the 15th century that discoveries take place in sculpture before they take place in painting. Um, and part of that really is due to the great genius, ingenio, and eye of Donatello. So I show you here the uh, London uh, relief of Christ giving the keys to St. Peter, another one of these amazing flattened reliefs, schiacciato reliefs, with this very deep landscape setting. Uh, and just to give you a sense of how active on the surface the carving and drawing in, in stone really is. And then show you uh, the wonderful Brancacci Chapel uh, painted by um, Masaccio and, uh, and others, later on Filippino Lippi, but the famous tribute money. So the St. George and the Dragon Relief is uh, 1415. The tribute money is, is like something like 1425. So it gets this notion of uh, these uh, powerful figures with this distant landscape that gets sort of uh, lighter in color, less color, because atmosphere is interfering with our vision. That is called aerial or atmospheric perspective. Uh, and then you have a little bit of linear perspective to set this perspective space into which figures are set. Another classic uh, Art 101 comparison would be to look at the St. George relief with that perspective space here, the linear, perspe the aerial perspective in the background, the sense of um, motion through the, uh, the flying draperies of the horsemen. Doesn't that remind you of Leonardo as well, that kind of animated energy of, of, of wind and motion, the, the rearing horse? Um, so, uh, again, uh, looking at sculpture inspired Masaccio as well. And there's just a detail of the beautiful uh, tribute money. And where does it go? It goes directly to Leonardo, again, the Madonna and Child with St. Anne, uh, with this amazing uh, atmospheric perspective at the ba in the background. Um, and the very soft, uh, delicate modeling. So that notion of sfumato or smokiness that we see at the back, I'm sure you've heard a, quite a bit about sfumato. But now when you go up to see our Donatello, you should think about how uh, that might well be where Leonardo began to think about looking at the world that way. So, um, so again, the comparison. Um, and it's not just the technique, but something about the compression of this group, the emotion of the group. He's also uh, appreciating, I believe, Donatello's uh, emotional intensity. Donatello brings things to life in a way that uh, really Leonardo then, um, it becomes so characteristic of his, uh, his great, great genius in painting. Again, that detail of the, of the atmosphere in the trees. Uh, and I compare it to one of the other, one, another of these great Leonardo drawings, unfortunately not here in the show, but um, the way Leonardo looked very closely at nature, but it's, it's nature being worked upon. You get the sense of the air swirling in this star of, of, of Bethlehem uh, that you see in, in the, um, the 
the background of the St. George relief. Uh, he then extrapolates to the big forces of nature, so the tiny observation of, of botanical um, studies with the air swirling through, and then these great, um, scene, these great drawings of floods and the coursing of water and the, the, way, the, uh, the way nature, the forces of nature just take over. And then his wonderful hair studies with these curls to, that, that have their own uh, inner life and are often lifted by, uh, by, whiff, by, 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 by little breaths of air. Um, when coming to think about compositions for paintings or for drawings, he, I show you this, uh, this uh, on the right you see the Madonna and Child with a cat. And you can see by now he's actually got it into a kind of framework. It's not too far from being ready to be translated perhaps into a painting. But on the, on, on the far screen, you see one of what uh, sometimes are called Leonardo's generative drawings. They're these incredibly quick, creative, um, energetic variations on postures. Uh, which in certain ways you see in the, in the sort of more finished drawing as well, all of these crazy lines that uh, show all the different possibilities of motion in space, um, which energize the composition. And they bring you to something like the great uh, Louvre Madonna of the Rocks. So, uh, you're wondering what this all has to do, perhaps, with sculpture. But I think something like the Donatello, that energizing of the relief field and the careful observation of um, distance. Well, here, it's actually he's thinking about sculpture in a slightly different way, in a very, very specific way. And that is uh, because uh, he's been drawing after and thinking about um, works of sculpture. You see the wonderful uh, mar uh, ancient marble, Boy with a Goose, which was part of the Medici collection. It's in the Uffizi now, and um, it's quite likely that Leonardo was part of the, one, the, um, the same kind of school for young artists that Michelangelo belonged to, the Medici Garden, where artists were able to look at and study and draw after and emulate uh, works of, antiqui of, of antique sculpture that were in the Medici collections. So this boy with a goose, in, in, uh, and I show you the wonderful baby that's up in the galleries uh, right now, uh, it's, it's Leonardo thinking about this ancient prototype and then bringing to it his amazing sense of life and animation. Um, so if we were to think in terms of, well, what, is, what else is Leonardo learning from this sculpture? Um, one thing is definitely the way light falls on the, a three-dimensional object. One of the things that in the Paragone, and I'm going to bring the Paragone up pretty much throughout the lecture, one of the things that a sculpture is criticized for is that, well, it's just there. You know, it's already three-dimensional. You don't have to figure out how to render the forms and then show how light falls on it. The light is actually outside the sculpture. Uh, and, you know, Leonardo very bluntly says, you know, sculpture is nothing other than it appears to be. Whereas the painter has to translate the three-dimensional forms and give them color and life and, and really try to control, and he has control, over how light falls on the forms. Uh, he, he calls basically light the arch enemy of sculpture because the sculptor really can't control it. It's just there and is sort of, uh, uh, the problem is you never know if it's gonna be sunny or rainy or any, you can't control it. But the painter controls that within the within the painting itself. So you see the way light falls very clearly on uh, the baby from this angle. He's in dark shadow there. And so we get to this notion of chiaroscuro modeling, light and shade, which is so central to Leonardo's art as well. 
Uh, another sculptor who worked in this very flattened and soft relief style is Desiderio da Settignano. And I show you his beautiful Madonna and Child at the Victoria and Albert in London, where you can see that amazing softness, that very, very shallow carving. I mean, you almost feel like the marble has become like wax or something. It's so subtly carved. And it um, develops from, um, from Donatello. And Desiderio is really the only other sculptor who gets that amazing uh, softness of modeling. Uh, and I show you his uh, Desiderio's beloved and lovely, adorable uh, little boy in the National Gallery in Washington. And I think we have to believe that Leonardo saw these kinds of objects and saw this style of carving and um, was very much moved by it. Uh, also, the, um, the tenderness of expression that we see in the little boy. Uh, this marble bust um, may, or something like it, uh, may have given rise to a, cu a couple of drawings by Leonardo of uh, the profile of a little boy on the far screen. And m many people who have looked at it have speculated, do you see the way it's really, really cut? Uh, and that might well reflect the way a marble bust is cut, right? Uh, and then front and back. So people argue about whether or not this uh, actually is done from life or from a sculpture. And that's another wonderful thing about Leonardo as, uh, as, dra as draftsman. You re it really would be very hard to tell, uh, except for such clues as the severe cutting off of the bust, the way a sculpture is cut off. Um, these, uh, one of the things that Leonardo says when people say, well, you know, it's hard for painters to create the sense of three-dimensionality, sculptors that's their big challenge. They have to create these objects in the round. And he said, oh, it's, not that, it's, not that it's not that big a deal. A painter just has to show, it's just two sides. You just need the front and the back, and you get all the information you need. And in a drawing like this, that's what he's trying to, uh, to do. He's trying to get all the information there uh, from, from these front and back views. Uh, but you know, the profile is important too, so. Uh, and then another sculpture by uh, Desiderio de Settignano that I just want you to have in your heads is this uh, wonderful bust in Berlin, sometimes called uh, Marietta Strozzi. But um, Desiderio, with that very sweet little boy and this image of a woman, really starts to animate the sculpted por portrait bust and bring these kinds of instantaneous reactions, uh, enlivening um, the, the, the art form. And I think this is also is important for Leonardo. So learning to look and learning to make, or learning to see and learning to make. I think I should have changed that. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about uh, Leonardo and Verrocchio. Um, I'm sure that you've looked at this a number of times, the painting uh, in the Uffizi of the Baptism of Christ, where uh, sort of the classic moment of encounter between a uh, pupil and master seems to be kind of culminate in that moment of the two angels where we think that the softening of the forms, the softness of the skin, um, the more delicate play of light, and then this area of um, sfumato landscape, atmospheric landscape, were probably um, added by Leonardo, the pupil of Verrocchio. That is not to say that the master wasn't a great master, even though the pupil may have outstripped, quote unquote, outstripped the master. Um, I just show you this splendidly beautiful, one of the most beautiful drawings, I think, of the Renaissance, uh, attributed to Verrocchio, by Verrocchio, I believe, uh, which is in Christ Church, Oxford, and has so much of that wonderful uh, animation of the hair, the very subtle uh, gradation of light and shade, um, so many things that we then see Leonardo developing in his own uh, drawing style and in his own art. 
Um, what would he have learned in Verrocchio's workshop? Well, many, many things about practice. I show you a couple of wonderful um, drawings uh, by the Florentine artist Mazzo Finiguera, or attributed to Mazzo, which are basically one artist drawing another artist in the workshop who is also drawing or sketching. And I think we have to imagine that this is how these guys were hanging out in their studio. You know, uh, oh, look, I'm going to capture Giovanni as he's making his little drawing. Uh, these are ready-made models, right? They're there. You can just capture them. They have a sense of life. Um, and it also points out the primacy of drawing in these workshops for both painters and sculptors, uh, the heart and soul at the beginning of all of this, all the arts, comes from this act of drawing. So Leonardo would have been in the midst of this kind of active workshop. Um, and so I would like to now turn to the very beautiful and very important um, um, drapery studies that are up at, we have two beautiful examples up in the show. And um, they really, are a witness to a very specific workshop practice, and that is the kind of focusing in just on the drapery, right, to make sure you get the sense of three-dimensionality, of mo movement through the drapery, and very, very specifically in a, in a work like this, the play of light and shade over the drapery, right? So all of that play of drapery really gives a sense of three-dimensionality, the deep, deep shadows, the highlight, uh, uh, the highlight white. Uh, and this is actually, in a certain ways, almost a little painting, even though it is a study of uh, drapery. Uh, the, the technique itself is very interesting because it's, it's um, a type of distemper. Um, I'm not quite sure what the medium is that's being used, but it's applied more like uh, paint on canvas. And indeed, this is on linen, and you can really see the, uh, you, and especially obviously up in the galleries, that this is not uh, paper, it's linen, it's prepared fabric. So, um, and, and very much, and then with white highlighting and wash to capture the highlights. So it reflects, and I think you can see that here, this is a really kind of a kind of disembodied piece of drapery, right? So what they would do is set up a, a kind of um, skeleton, you know, using, uh, if it were us, we might use a coat hanger and drape, and drape um, some, some drapery over it. So there's a kind of um, structure over which the drapery is placed, and then the artist can draw after that. The fact that it's on linen reflects the practice of creating this, this, these draperies covering them in, sometimes in some kind of, almost like a paper mache kind of thing, you know, so you can get it to be uh, pliable and then to sort of stay put when you want to draw it. Uh, so the medium itself reflects a practice that was, we know to have been practiced in the Verrocchio shop, this attention to these, um, to these drapery studies. Um, and then the other drawing also in the show it is a little less disembodied. It, you can see that the attention is being played to, paid to the fall of the drapery, but it is actually, you see the figure, right? And it's very likely the figure of uh, St. Thomas uh, pointing to the wound in his side. Uh, sorry, uh, Christ, Christ showing the missing St. Thomas. Uh, so I've uh, very closely reflecting one of uh, Verrocchio's most important sculptures, uh, the, the, the beautiful Christ and St. Thomas. So I'll go back to that. So you see how that gesture and the fall of drapery, uh, and you see that here where Christ is revealing the wound to the doubting St. Thomas in these two um, uh, life-size bronze sculptures. So this kind of animated, excited drapery that Verrocchio presents here would surely have been worked out in the kinds of drawings that we see uh, up in the show, and that Leonardo would have learned so much from. Uh, and then you see the, the two together. You see the, the gesture is similar. I'm not saying this is a study for this, but it's the same, uh, the same kind of uh, thought that would have gone into the presentation of the drapery in uh, Verrocchio's shop, and that Leonardo would have been very aware of. 
Another characteristic of the, Saint, the, the uh, Christ and St. Thomas uh, is that it was ex it unusually sensitive to its uh, placement on the exterior of the church of Or San Michele in Florence, so that the, um, the composition which, uh, unfortunately now, the, the, or fortunately for the sculptures themselves, they are now out of their niches and in a museum. So you no longer see the originals at Or San Michele. But what you can still recreate is the act of walking down the street in either direction and watching as the kind of drama unfolds. If you come from behind Thomas, you're coming towards the, the niche from that direction. You don't quite know what's going on until you get to the front. And so you have this sort of um, development of the narrative in, in time and space uh, that uh, is very, very important for the notion of how you look at sculpture and how sculpture interacts with the viewer. So if, you, and if, so if you're walking this way, you see St. Thomas sort of sticking out of the niche, and you're wondering what's going on in there until you get there. So there's a kind of development of narrative in space. And uh, Verrocchio's wonderful little Puto with Dolphin uh, is another example of how he was so uh, capable of animating space around an object with the idea that uh, this open pose with the, the dolphin, the turned head, the kicked out leg, it really makes you want to walk around the sculpture to understand it. Uh, and uh, these are lessons that, um, that Leonardo certainly was learning. Uh, Verrocchio's uh, marble sculpture of a woman holding primroses uh, is really central to this conversation. So you see a wonderful marble sculpture now including hands all the way down to her waist. So you're really seeing a lot more of the figure, right? It's not like one of those portrait busts that are cut here, but the animation of hands brings, uh, makes, brings the portrait bust closer to being the full figure, the full person. Uh, and it is often uh, related to Leonardo's Ginevra de Benci in um, Washington, uh, particularly because, uh, well, really, the Ginevra has almost a marmorial quality to it. And uh, there's that great smoothness to her, to her face, that beautiful um, white, um, smooth uh, visage. And uh, it, could, it could well be that this painting is a paragone, a paint, so, you know, so he's going to compare himself to a sculpture like the uh, woman with primroses, particularly because there's the notion that it was probably cut down and might well once have included the hands holding a flower. And the key to that is that there's this, it, the back is also painted and has this motto and this design. And this is how the painting looks today. And this is the reconstruction. So it looks like there's something missing. Um, and I just show you the, the back in, in, in its frame to give you a sense of how much, it's, how much it might have been cut down. But also because I want to call your attention to the background of this uh, motto of, of Ginevra, uh, it's painted on as if it were on porphyry. So Leonardo is definitely making a paragone statement. Because one of the things that, um, that people say about sculpture, why it's better, is that it endures longer. It lasts longer. And no stone endures more than porphyry. It's an ancient stone. The quarries, the quarries were already uh, 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 closed by the Renaissance. There was no more new porphyry. All the porphyry had to come from ancient, uh, ancient sources, like, like cutting columns. And um, so what does that mean for the front, for, for, the, for the front and that kind of marmorial quality? Well, it's painted, in theory, on stone. She's painted on this porphyry, and that uh, makes this image of Ginevra endure like porphyry. These are the kinds of concepts that the Renaissance loved when thinking about <laughs> paragone. Furthermore, um, the inclusion of the hands are very cl uh, closely related to this beautiful hand study by, by Leonardo, which I hope you've seen in other 
uh, in other contexts. Again, this practice of studying uh, parts, the hands, the drapery, the heads, come out of the Verrocchio shop. So this kind of uh, a passage in the sculpture would have uh, been treated to this kind of treatment in drawing before the artist ever got to carving his marble. And of course, the culmination of that notion, the complete quality of the Mona Lisa uh, is part of this development. So, thinking like a sculptor, something that he learned from Verrocchio, but something that he, of course, uh, himself, uh, as a sculptor, would be doing. When we looked at the little baby sketches, the sketches of the bust, I, I was talking about how he said, oh, all you need is two sides. Well, one of the drawings up in the show actually gives us uh, three views of the same head, right? The profile, the three-quarter view, and the full front view. Whenever you see this kind of drawing that's showing uh, objects from, or images from various points of view, think in terms of him saying, well, yeah, the sculptor just has to look at it. I have to create it on a flat, on a flat um, surface. So these kinds of studies that go around the object or turn the object to get all those views, because the sculpture has multiple views in the round, right? The painter has to get it all onto a flat uh, surface. Uh, and that's true of, his, of the beautiful horse study that's up in the galleries. So that you see, do you see how it's just, he's, here's the profile here, it's a three, a three quarter from the, from the rear, uh, three quarters from the other side. So he's going around the, in this very creative placement on the page, but he's trying to get the three dimensions onto that page. That's thinking like a sculptor. That's thinking in the three dimensions. Right? Uh, and this is the, 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 the most, uh, the, the, most cl the clearest example of this. Two sheets from one of his sketchbooks where he's studying the shoulder and he's giving us eight views on how the shoulder works. To understand the anatomy, but also to get that sense of the third dimension all the way around. He thinks about it when he's doing these, um, these kinds of drawings, like his, these spectacular skull drawings. He's understanding the exterior, the exterior surface, but the interior volume as well. He's thinking in three dimensions at all times. And uh, the painting that really, uh, for me, tells this story better than any is the beautiful um, woman with an ermine from Krakow. Uh, identified as uh, the mistress of Ludovico Sforza, Cecilia Gallerani, um, because, first of all, that sense of volume that we just saw in the skull is so beautifully conveyed in sort of her perf perfectly beautiful uh, oval, uh, uh, ovoid, more than oval, head. Um, but look at the way she is um, constructed in space. Leonardo gives us no background here. You don't have the background, say, of the Mona Lisa. It's really against this dark foil against which uh, the figure is uh, developed so that you have one shoulder coming forward, the, the, the head turning against the shoulder. Uh, all the things that that brings um, it looks very much like she might have just been looking at us and someone walked in the door and she turned her head to see who it was. He animates the figure in that way. He stresses the three-dimensionality of her neck by giving her this beautiful jet necklace that gives you this rounding. Uh, we've been looking at the hands a lot and you see that that happens here, of course. It is one big hand, isn't it? Uh, it it's a very powerful hand and, of course, uh, she cradles the ermine, who's a really big ermine, uh, and that is probably because he's an, he's an image of, uh, he's, the ermine is one of Ludovico Sforza, the Duke of Milan, uh, and Cecilia's lover. Uh, that is one of his emblems. So there's a whole erotic uh, element to this portrait, of course, that has the, the hand caressing the ermine, who also is developed in beautiful contrapposto, Right, all hit the head against the against the body, uh, and uh, and looking out the way Cecilia is looking out. 
uh, against the dark foil, that play of light and dark, which contributes so much to the sense of three-dimensionality, the way light falls very consistently on the portrait. Uh, all of this gives you the sense of the figure developed in space. He's thinking like a sculpt sculptor. Uh, and I have just thought of this this morning, and I don't know if anybody has ever said this, but that black, black background, uh, to me, or it reminds me of paintings a little later on that are painted on uh, black stone, which in Italian is called Pietra di Paragone, that same word, because it's the way that gold is tested. It's a kind of touchstone, uh, and that kind of black, uh, deep black obsidian or Pietra di Paragone uh, might have that same function that we just saw in the um, porphyry on the back of the uh, on the back of the Ginevra de Benci. Uh, just to get it, just to compare it to one of the most beautiful and wonderful profile portraits by Ghirlandaio, uh, which uh, follows a more uh, classic Renaissance portrait form, the, the pure profile uh, with all of her beautiful uh, array of clothes and jewels and things in the background. Uh, they are of equal beauty. Uh, but I think you can see the leaps uh, into the third dimension that Leonardo has taken uh, in every way, not just the third dimension physically, but the, third dim the, the, the dimension of humanity that he brings to Cecilia. And just a comparison that you, you now uh, will be familiar with. And uh, that other very, very beautiful drawing upstairs, uh, it's the same kind of thing where Turned, the head turned against the shoulder as if, as if turning to look. That kind of animation in the third dimension uh, is something that Leonardo really is working uh, and thinking about. So Leonardo's sculptures. And um, indeed, it's a bit a story of, um, pretty much a story of failure. Uh, because we know that, um, I'm sure you've had this quoted to you several times in your course, but you remember he writes to the Duke of, um, to, well, he's not quite Duke yet, but the leader of Milan who will be the Duke, Ludovico Sforza, in the 1480s, and he talks about all of his abilities as an engineer, and he's going to help him with any wars and battles that he, um, that he might be undertaking, and there were lots of them in this period. Um, at the very end of the letter, he, of course, says, I can also execute sculpture in marble, bronze, and clay. And he would have learned all those things from Verrocchio. Likewise, in painting, I can do every possible, uh, everything possible as well as any other, who, who, whosoever he may be. So I'm as good as anybody when it comes to painting. Moreover, uh, work could be undertaken on the bronze horse uh, which will be to the immortal glory and eternal honor of the auspicious memory of his lordship, your father, and the illustrious house of Sforza. So he, um, he's heard that they probably want to be creating a, an equestrian monument, and he says that he can do it. And that is probably the most famous um, instance of Leonardo's sculptures. And of course, we know that it's quite a sad story, which I will tell but I also just wanted to read to you another little excerpt from his uh, treatise on painting, where he talks about a kind of a, a somewhat less ambitious sculptures that he, uh, he, he's making. Um, because as much as he criticized sculpture and as much as he considered himself to be a painter, he too uh, probably used small scale sculptures and to model to get a sense of how things look in the round. And when we think about the Cecilia uh, Gallerani and how you get the sense of it in the three dimensions, uh, Leonardo was probably extremely proficient modeling small sculpture as well in wax and clay. And he saw modeling as basically the sister to drawing because it's where you work out your ideas. But to him, that wasn't sculpture. Sculpture was the big marble sculpture that, you, that created you know, clouds of um, marble dust. So uh, it's quite um, varied, uh, the, his ideas of what sculpture is. Uh, but um, uh, uh, this quote, I think, uh, makes that point. 
Thus, painting is held to be sister to modeling, from which it follows that painting is ant to sculpture. Sometimes you wonder if they get a little carried away with these, uh, these things. Um, accordingly, it has always given me much pleasure and delight, as, and this is sculpture, uh, as can be seen by my various complete horses and limbs and heads and also human heads representing Our Lady and complete youthful Christs and fragments and heads of old men in good number. So we have to imagine that Leonardo was doing a lot of modeling of, uh, in clay if he covered all those uh, subjects uh, in modeling. Uh, but the notion of uh, an equestrian monument is one of the great challenges for um, a sculptor in the Renaissance because it harkens back to classical antiquity. Uh, I show you the famous um, horse tamers on the Quirinale Hill in Rome and the famous Marcus Aurelius at the, on the Capitoline, um, which, which were known and well studied in the Renaissance and stood as the great challenge. Uh, the other, um, one of the other things that antique sculpture would uh, tell an artist of the Renaissance we talked, is that sculpture endures, it lasts over time. And here you have an ancient marble, a monumental ancient marble, and a monumental ancient bronze to prove that. Uh, and of course, there was very little, if any, painting known from antiquity. So that was one chip on the, on the painter's shoulders, because sculpture endures and, and, and brings the Renaissance back to classical antiquity. Uh, so there's a series of uh, great uh, equestrian monuments, this by Donatello in Padua, this by Verrocchio uh, in Venice. And it's sometimes argued uh, back and forth uh, as to what Leonardo's role in this uh, equestrian monument to the, uh, the, the condottiere Colleoni might have been. But there's no evidence that he had anything to do with it. It's just something that, um, that you have to ask the question. Where, what, at what point was it in when, when Leonardo was still in his studio? Is it was drawings made? Were models made? But once uh, Leonardo has his own possibility of doing an equestrian monument, he decides he's going to do something even more radical than this very animated, spectacular, monumental uh, sculpture by Verrocchio. He's going to create a rearing horse, right? So Gattamelata walks nicely with his, his, little, his, his front hoof on a on a um, cannonball, and that's because the bronze, it's, it's making sure that the bronze can support itself. Uh, he's not gonna trip over that. It's actually a device to, 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 so that the horse stands on all four legs and can support the weight of the bronze. Uh, Verrocchio has made the leap and has been able to lift the front leg up. These are uh, technical advances. But what Leonardo wants to do is actually create a rearing horse, which would mean, mean on a monumental scale, all the weight has to be borne by the two back legs of the horse. This is, proves to be impossible at the time. You can see down here, you see what that is? That's a figure. So that's going to be the thing that might support the rearing horse, support the weight. But even this was not to be. It was too, diff it was too much of a challenge. Uh, and just another one of these spectacular drawings where Leonardo is just, it's kind of free association on what horses and the energy and, and uh, kind of internal uh, power of horses can do. So he hopes he can translate that into a rearing horse. Um, but he discovers that that's not going to happen. Uh, and instead, his horse is going to be really, 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 really big. So he plans a walking horse, a pacing horse, uh, and he gets as far as creating the monumental clay model, uh, which was set up in the, um, in the court at Milan. Uh, it was supposed to be something like 24 feet tall, and it was the clay model, and it was destroyed by the invading uh, French troops in 1499. So this is one of Leonardo's uh, really great failures, I'm sure he considered it an enormous failure, that he never managed to cast 
the bronze. Uh, the monumental horse has uh, been uh, cast a number of times now, but not, sorry, not cast, this is a modern reconstruction of Leonardo's horse, about 24 feet high, and it's made of fiberglass. Um, so um, he was not quite up to the task, and things changed, the political situation changed, and he was never able to complete this uh, great commission. Um, but uh, I'd like to conclude the, the, this morning by talking to you about uh, the work of Giovanni Francesco Rustici, who, um, after Leonardo leaves Milan, he's a very peripatetic artist, as you know by now. He comes back to Florence a couple of times, around, around 1501, and then again um, um, stays through, you know, 1508. He's there. He's, it's that great moment in time when Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Raphael are all in Florence around 1508. Uh, you know, of course, the whole story of the, the two great battle murals uh, being planned by the great sculptor Michelangelo and the great painter Leonardo, uh, the Battle of Cascina and the Battle of Anghiari. Uh, during this time, around 1506, 1508, Leonardo was actually living in the same house uh, with uh, Giovanni Francesco Rustici. They were very, very close, uh, working together and kind of thinking together. And there are a group of terracotta sculptures, this at the Bargello in Florence, that, is, that are often associated with Rustici. And they really do develop out of these kinds of uh, enormously highly energized uh, drawings that Leonardo was working through that ultimately uh, would lead to the battle, his, his ideas for the Battle of, Cash, of, of Anghiari. Um, so Rustici, in a certain way, translates those ideas into the three dimensions of these terracotta sculptures. But Rustici's great um, commission came from the uh, Baptistry of Florence, and I show you a view of uh, that most important church in Florence, the baptistry, uh, which for uh, Florence, which is the patron saint of Florence, is St. John the Baptist. Uh, in the Renaissance, they believed that the baptistry was an ancient Roman temple of Mars. Um, it is one of the central buildings in Florentine identity. Uh, well, in the 16th century, they were um, commissioning uh, sculpt large-scale sculpture groups to go over the doors of the, of the baptistry uh, because the earlier 14th century sculptor sculptures were really falling apart. Uh, and so they were being, the baptistry was being renewed. And so the most important commission of Rustici's career as a sculptor was for this over-life-sized group of St. John the Baptist preaching uh, and uh, being listened to by, um, by uh, these two. So does that remind you of anything that we started with, that drawing that's up in the gallery of the, the young, vigorous, bearded man, and then here the, the sort of the bald, the bald uh, heavier set guy? That's a paragone, right? Um, it, it filters right into Rustici's art, those notions, and of course with St. John at the center. Um, not to be forgotten when we look at these sculptures, they're often taken um, uh, straight on, but you have to uh, see them from below the way... Um, this group is actually on the other side of the baptistry. This is it's, I, don't, I couldn't find a view that actually shows, but it's a, a, at the similar height, obviously, to these two groups. Um, and it really is when you look at him from below that he really engages you uh, the way we've seen so many of Leonardo's works um, do. Uh, and there you see them uh, in an installation in Washington when these, these three sculptures came to America after um, conservation uh, to give you a sense of the scale and... Um, and the beauty of the surfaces. So when Rustici was making the, these sculptures, Leonardo says that, he, uh, well, uh, Vasari tells us that uh, Leonardo was by, him, by his side at every moment. Uh, so this has long given rise to the notion that Leonardo was very deeply involved in the, uh, in the creation of these sculptures. And it's 
quite believable, I think, from what we've been seeing, uh, that kind of the, the way the drapery works, the, the amazing uh, naturalism of the, uh, of, the, of the physiognomies, the carefully worked out poses, um, the contrast, as I said, the paragone between the two uh, members of the audience, uh, and just a, an image of uh, the bearded man, and you, you know, that kind of tugging of the beard, the, um, development of the, um, the characterization. But I think you also see in this uh, bronze, can't you just feel the wax still evident? You know, this was made a great big wax model, uh, and you still have that sense of hands and tools working the wax that still is translated into the bronze itself. Well, that brings me to the other um, object in the MFA's collection that really does dovetail very closely uh, with Leonardo. So I'd like to spend the rest of the time talking to you about our St. John the Baptist, which is up in the, um, up in the Renaissance corridor on the second floor. Uh, because um, this sculpture, which had languished for a long time in storage up in our attic, um, it came into the collection in 1950, and it needed conservation, and basically it went up to the attic, and nobody looked at it until about 2002, when we were emptying the attic in order to build the American wing. And um, uh, we pulled him out, and um, someone said, oh, there's something I think you're going to want to see. And I had my first look at the sculpture, which at some point at least someone had put a bag over his head and uh, to try to keep him clean. Uh, and I was really just bowled over by the quality of the object. Uh, he even made the New York Times in 2007 when uh, he was part of the Donatello to John Bologna show um, and now greets you as you walk into the gallery upstairs. Uh, so let's think about what this sculpture might have had to do with Leonardo. Uh, here the sculpture is before conservation. You can see he's a mess. He's filthy. There are breaks. Uh, when Abby Hyken, the conservator, started to work on him, he, she discovered, for example, a wasp's nest caught up between his legs. Um, it, it, interestingly enough, it belonged to um, the Guggenheims. And Mrs. Solomon Guggenheim, when she uh, made her, uh, her, her will, she, uh, she invited uh, uh, um, curators to come and look at her collection, and they could have whatever they wanted. And this was in their Long Island home. And a very wise curator already said, well, you know, uh, we don't know who it's by. It's, it's supposed to be, you know, Andrea della Robbia in the middle of the, 15th, middle of the 16th century or della Robbia shop, but maybe someday someone will figure it out. And that same curator made the connection, once the sculpture was in the building, with the great Rustici group um, from the baptistry. But it never went further than that little connection. It seems to be related to the Rustici. Uh, and indeed, um, it's, a, it's quite different in many ways, but it's quite similar in others. This is a, this is a you know, John, St. John is about that big. The Rustici is over life, the, 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 the St. John, the bronze is over life size. But you can see uh, similarities in the, uh, in the costume, the, the, but of course this is all St. John, the, ver the pointing figure. But for me, the thing that really uh, seemed to me to be very close was uh, the head. The animation of the, of the beard and the, and the hair, and most especially, something that we've been looking at in some of Leonardo's works, that way that he so carefully works out the turn of the head, the tilt of the head on the neck. And we remember that Rustici was working that out in order to address the um, the crowd below, but something about how this amazing attention to the neck and the clavicle uh, and the extraordinary expressive quality of the, of the terracotta really, when I saw the, 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 the bronze uh, conserved, I said, yeah, you know, that is really close to Rustici. And um, he was, I, we, I, I published him in a in an exhibition catalog as attributed to Rustici, and within four years, something like three monographs came out on Rustici, all accepting the attribution to Rustici. And then um, for an exhibition at the Bargello, the St. John went home uh, to, uh, to this exhibition dedicated to Rustici with the attribution generally accepted. 
So, um, so he is our little piece of Leonardo right here in the collection. Uh, like uh, other works uh, that we've been looking at, he looked back to Donatello, um, which uh, you see the St. Mary Magdalene in wood by Donatello uh, about 1435. It's kind of a moment of Donatello revival. Uh, we date the Rustici around 1505 to 1515, and that encompasses the period that Rustici was working on the uh, bronze group. Uh, and again, it is that amazing turn of the head against the shoulder and animation of the, uh, the face that is so strikingly similar to things we've been looking at in Leonardo. Uh, I show you uh, a drawing by Leonardo the, um, uh, for St. Mary Magdalene, where very close to the working out of the pose. Again, how the, the way the turn of the head, the tilt of the head against the shoulder, the arm coming across. So this is Leonardo thinking like a sculptor again, right? And this is how uh, it, I think it translates into our work by Rustici. Uh, you'll remember, of course, the Cecilia Gallerani for the, that same quality. Uh, and it was really through the technique of this piece that we discovered even more the way it reflected workshop practices that we've been looking at. So this is what it looked like. I mean, it was really a mess. The finger, the, 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 this, this was a repair, this was a repair. It was filthy. Uh, and uh, this is a wonderful uh, draw, uh, uh, photograph of the piece before conservation, uh, which shows um, a, a, a UV photo of the surface. And uh, when you look at a, a sculpture like this under ultraviolet light, um, these areas that turn out light uh, represent areas where there's been overpainting on the surface. So if you look at where the breaks come in the St. John, okay, he, he did break in half. He broke at the wrist. You see all that gunky overpaint. We didn't need UV to tell us that that was there. You can see that he broke at his neck, right? Uh, when the sculpture was stressed, uh, it, th those are the places that it broke. And he broke, this arm broke off as well. Uh, and it was when I was looking at the sculpture taken apart uh, with Abby, and I saw this kind of, uh, the hand just sort of there, that I realized that what Rustici must have been doing uh, was working the hands, which are of course so important for the gestures, as individual um, models, and then sticking it back onto the the, the sculpture as a whole. And that would simply mean that when it was fired in the kiln, there was always a weakness there. So when we had one of the other hand off and it was sitting in a box and this, this I, I couldn't help but make the connection with the Leonardo uh, hand studies that uh, Rustici was surely uh, working out a similar way in the third dimension. And there's the beautifully restored hand uh, and then, again, really, here he is a mess again. I'm just showing you that this, this hoof was uh, a repair that Abby took off. Uh, the finger, here she is working on that beautiful area of the neck. Remember I was saying it broke at the neck, and I can imagine Rustici trying again and again to get that beautiful position by taking the head off, modeling it, shifting it a little on the, on the body. Um, and that's left an area of weakness in the model itself. Uh, so the repaired finger, the pointing finger gesture, uh, which uh, is in the bronze as well, and of course should recall to you that wonderful uh, painting by Leonardo of St. John the Baptist with that characteristic uh, gesture, that mysterious gesture, also that turn of the head, tilt of the head, crossing over of the arm, uh, which we see in our Rustici as well. And finally, we've talked so much about drapery studies. So when we took the hoof off to repair it, we could see the way Rustici actually modeled the, modeled the drapery separate from the body and stuck it on. Can you see that? You can really see the join there. So he was doing those kinds of drapery studies, but now he's doing it in clay. It also told us exactly how long the, this hoof should be because there's this little indentation. So when Abby repaired it, 
She made a hoof that was shorter than the other one, so it could fit right into that little indentation. So it's certainly truer as a repair to the original. And there's the obvious um, comparison. You can go and look at this drapery study and then go up and upstairs and look at the animated drapery there. Uh, part of the drapery came off, and there was a wonderful fingerprint. And that was the one moment when I, it was a time when in the news there was all this talk about Leonardo fingerprints. And I was like, well, we have a fingerprint. What if it's Leonardo? And that's as far as I went because I have to tell you that in sculpture studies about Leonardo, people cannot resist attributing works to him. And indeed, even our St. Saint, Saint John um, has been attributed to Leonardo. I don't believe it. Uh, but someone presented in a Renaissance Society talk where they did this little montage and stuck our Rustici in because they thought it was better than Rustici's St. John. Uh, and therefore, had to be by Leonardo. Uh, I didn't go there. Uh, I want to make one final point about the medium of glazed terracotta, uh, because it too addresses that famous paragone that we've been talking about. Leonardo himself liked this medium of glazed terracotta invented by Luca della Robbia, and I show you our, um, our Luca della Robbia up in the galleries. Uh, and why? Because what this glazing technique does is it helps to make color and soft terracotta, uh, fragile terracotta, permanent. And we've heard about how permanence is so important as a, as a quality that sculpture has, but painting does it. But, what for, but for Leonardo, strangely enough, this kind of object would have been more painting than sculpture. So he approved of the technique of glazing of, of, of this kind of glazing over clay that we see in the St. John as well. And of course, you know that Leonardo was the great experimenter, and as soon, pretty much as soon as he painted his Last Supper, it started to deteriorate. So issues of permanence were vital to him, and it would have been one of the things that he was most jealous of when it came to sculpture. So um, I'll conclude with that and take some questions, if you like, um, but again, uh, do enjoy the show upstairs. You have some beautiful examples to think about Paragone and Leonardo and sculpture as well. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll bring the wireless microphone to you. There has been uh, a report of, of contention between Michelangelo and uh, Leonardo, and your description of Michelangelo's description of um, that sculpture is enticing to suggest that maybe that is part of what that contention might have been. Absolutely. Um, we could certainly do a whole other lecture on the comparison between Leonardo as great painter and Michelangelo as great sculptor, um, because there are mom real moments when they intersect, but also because they themselves define themselves that way. When Michelangelo is painting the Sistine ceiling, he's saying, I am not a painter, I'm a sculptor. So absolutely, they st and then they stand for the rest of history as the paragon of sculpture and the paragon of, of and they were certainly, we know, Battle of Anghiari, Battle of Kashina, they were, they were right up against each other. So absolutely, you're absolutely right. You talked about the painting on porphyry. Was there any particular effort had to be made with the paint to make it stick to the stone? Um, in this case, the, the, um, the, the back of the Ginevra de Benci is actually fictive porphyry. It's painted to look like porphyry. However, there is a whole tradition of painting on stone that develops. And um, there is prep you do have to do some preparation for the stone. But um, in the 16th century in particular, there's a real desire to paint on stone for that very reason, that it conveys permanence and um, durability and preciousness, because these stones are so precious. Okay, well, thank you very much.
Thank you. Thanks.